Hey friends, it's your teen and tween librarian, Rebecca, and we're back for another episode of Bedtime Stories. Last episode, we saw um, Hans and Axel and Professor Liedenbrock experience some very warm hospitality from a poor and extremely large family um, on their journey. And um, this episode, we're going to see them at their very last stop in civilization before they head into Sneffels. Um, as well as see Oxel bring up a very, very good point. They're heading into a volcano. Shouldn't they be worried? We'll find out in chapter 14. Enjoy. <laughs> Chapter 14, A Final Argument. Stoppy is a village of about 30 huts, built on lava in the rays of sunshine reflected by the volcano. It lies in the bed of a little fjord, shut in by a basalt wall of the strangest appearance. As is well known, basalt is a brown rock of igneous origin. It assumes regular shapes arranged in the most surprising patterns. Here, nature has done her work geometrically, with set square, compasses, and plumb line. If elsewhere, her art consists in flinging huge masses together in disorder, unfinished cones and imperfect pyramids in a weird jumble of lines, here, wishing to set an example of regularity and anticipating the earliest architects, she has created an order of severe simplicity, unsurpassed by either the splendors of Babylon or the wonders of Greece. I had, of course, heard of the Giant's Causeway in Ireland, and of Fingal's Cave in one of the Hebrides, but I had never yet set eyes on a basaltic formation. At Stoppi, this phenomenon was to be seen in all its beauty. The wall, shutting in the fjord, looked like the whole coast of the peninsula, consisted of a series of vertical columns 30 feet high. These straight, perfectly proportioned pillars supported an architrave of horizontal columns which projected so as to form an arch over the sea. At intervals under this natural roof, the eye was caught by beautiful vaulted openings through which the waves came foaming in. A few fragments of basalt columns, torn from their place by the fury of the ocean, lay on the ground like the remains of an ancient temple, ruins which had remained eternally young, and over which the centuries had passed without leaving any trace. Such was our last halting place on earth. Hans had brought us here with great skill, and it reassured me a little to think that he was going to stay with us. On arriving at the door of the rector's house, a simple, low-built cabin, no more imposing or more comfortable than its neighbors, I saw a man shoeing a horse with a hammer in his hand and a leather apron around his waist. Salvertu, said the guide. Got dog, answered the blacksmith in perfect Danish. Kirkoherda, said Hans, turning to my uncle. The rector, re repeated the latter. It seems, Axel, that this good man is the rector. Meanwhile, our guide was explaining the situation to the Kirkoherde, who, stopping his work for a moment, uttered a sort of cry which is doubtless used between horses and horse dealers. Immediately, a tall, shrewish-looking woman came out of the hut. As she was not six feet tall, she was certainly not far short of it. I was afraid that she might offer the travelers the usual Icelandic kiss, but she did nothing of the sort, and indeed was none too gracious in inviting us into her house. The guest room struck me as the worst in the whole rectory, small, dirty, and evil smelling. But we had to make the best of it. The rector did not seem to go in for traditional hospitality, far from it. But before the day was over, I saw that we were dealing with a blacksmith, a fisherman, a hunter, a joiner, but not in any respect with a minister of the Lord. Admittedly, it was a weekday, but perhaps he was different on Sunday. I have no desire to say anything against these poor ecclesiastics, who, after all, have a wretched life. They receive a ridiculous, ridiculously small pittance from the Danish government, and from their parish they get a quarter of the tithe, which does not amount to as much as 60 marks or, or 4 pounds a year. Hence, the need to work for their living. But after fishing and hunting and shoeing horses for a while, one eventually gets into the habit of talking and behaving like hunters, fishermen, and 
other rather uncultivated people. And that same evening, I noticed that sobriety was not one of our host's virtues. My uncle soon saw what sort of man he had to deal with. Instead of a good and learned man, he was faced with a coarse, vulgar peasant. He therefore decided to begin his great expedition straight away and to leave this inhospitable personage. He ignored his own tiredness and resolved to spend a few days on the mountain. The preparations for our departure were accordingly made the very day after our arrival at Stapi. Hans hired the services of three Icelanders to take the place of the horses in carrying our things, but it was made clear that as soon as we arrived at the crater, these natives were to turn back and leave us to our their own devices. My uncle was now obliged to explain to the guide that he intended to explore the interior of the volcano as far as he could go. Hans simply nodded his head. To go there, or anywhere else, to plunge into the bowels of his island or to cross its surface, was all one to him. As for me, I had been distracted by the incidents on our journey and had to some extent forgotten the future. But now fear gripped me once again. But what could I do? The place to oppose Professor Liedenbrock would have been Hamburg, not the foot of Sneffels. One idea worried me more than all the rest, a terrifying idea calculated to shake firmer nerves than mine. Let me see, I said to myself. We are going to climb Sneffels. Good. We are going to descend into the crater. Good. Others have done the same and lived to tell the tale. But that isn't all. If we find a passage leading into the bowels of the earth, if that confounded Sack Newsom spoke the truth, we are going to lose our way among the subterranean galleries of the volcano. Now there is no proof that Sneffels is extinct. How can we be sure that an eruption isn't brewing at this very moment? Just because the monster has been asleep since 1229, does it follow that it can never wake up again? And if it does wake up, what will become of us? This was a matter requiring serious thought, and serious thought I gave it. I could not sleep without dreaming of eruptions, and the more I thought about it, the less the idea of playing the part of a volcanic cinder appealed to me. Finally, I could not bear it any longer, and I decided to state my case to my uncle as cleverly as I could, in the form of a completely impossible hypothesis. I went to see him and told him of my fears, drawing back to give him room for the expected explosion. I've been thinking about that, he replied simply. What did he mean by those words? Was he actually going to listen to reason? Was he thinking of giving up his project? This was too good to be true. After a few moments silence, during which I did not dare to ask him any questions, he went on. I've been thinking about that ever since we arrived at Stapi. I've been pondering over the important question that you've just put to me, for we mustn't be imprudent. No, indeed, I said emphatically. Sneffels has been silent for 600 years, but it may speak again. Now eruptions are always preceded by certain well-known phenomena. I have therefore questioned the local inhabitants and examined the ground, and I can assure you, Axel, that there will be no eruption. This emphatic declaration left me speechless and amazed. You don't believe me? said my uncle. Well then, follow me. I obeyed without a word. Leaving the parsonage, the professor took a straight path which, through an opening in the basaltic wall, led away from the sea. Soon, we were in the open country, if one can give that name to a vast expanse of volcanic debris. The land looked as if it had been crushed under a rain of huge rocks of trap, basalt, granite, and every kind of igneous material. Here and there, I could see white exhalations rising into the air. These vapors, known as reykir in Icelandic, were coming from the hot springs, and their force revealed the volcanic activity underground. This seemed to me to justify my fears, so I was disappointed when my uncle said to me, You see all these vapors, Axel? Well, they prove that we have nothing to fear from the volcano. I don't see how they prove anything of the sort, I said. Listen. The professor went on. At the approach of an eruption, these vapors become twice as active and then disappear completely while the eruption is in progress. For the imprisoned gases, once the pressure has been relieved, escape by way of the crater instead of through the fissures in the ground. So, 
If these vapors remain in their usual state, if their activity doesn't increase, and if the wind and rain don't give place to a still and heavy atmosphere, then you may be sure that there is no eruption in the offing. But enough. When science has spoken, it behooves us all to be silent. I returned to the parsonage, utterly crestfallen. My uncle had beaten me with his scientific arguments. All the same, I had one hope left, and this was that when we reached the bottom of the crater, we should find no passage. And in spite of all the sock in the world, it would be impossible to go any deeper. I had a terrible nightmare that night, in which I was in the depths of a volcano, from which I was shot into interplanetary space in the shape of an eruptive rock. The next day, the 23rd of June, Hans was waiting for us with his companions, laden with the provisions, tools, and instruments. Two iron-shod sticks, two rifles, and two cartridge belts had been set aside for my uncle and myself. Hans, as a cautious man, had added to our baggage a leather bottle full of water, which, together with our flasks, assured us of a week's water. It was nine in the morning. The rector and his tall shrew of a wife were waiting at the door. We imagined that they wanted to bid us a kind farewell. But this farewell took the unexpected form of a heavy bill, in which everything was charged for, even the poisonous air we had breathed in that pastoral house. This worthy couple were holding us to ransom like any Swiss innkeeper and putting a high price on their dubious hospitality. My uncle paid without quibbling. A man setting off for the center of the earth does not haggle over a few rix dollars. Once this matter had been settled, Hans gave the signal for departure, and a few moments later, we had left Stoppy. And that's the end of chapter 14. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Bedtime Stories. Make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing to the library's YouTube channel. You can also find out what's happening at the library by visiting us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Or you can always just go to the library's website. I hope to see you again for the next episode of Bedtime Stories. But until then, be well and sleep well.